Okay, wonderful. Paula, welcome. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Uh, so Paula, you uh, and I met obviously during um, master's uh, in mass management and leadership program at Pepperdine. Mm -hmm. And I know you graduated, I think at the end of 2022. Correct. I just graduated, um, well, just last August, 2023. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really thrilled and excited that you're the first interviewing that I'm conducting having completed that MSML program uh, because it's something I had put on hold um, when I started. Mm. Um, so I'm really excited to just talk to you today and learn from you and your experience and um, obviously again posting it on YouTube is so that others can learn. Do you want to start just telling a little bit about yourself, you know, a summary? I know you're currently the Chief Operating Officer at Encorico. Um, so any details you want to share about yourself and or your organization you think are important for people to know? Um, well, first, I want to say thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here uh, talking with you. It's so nice, the technology that we can be in different states and um, talk like we're in the room next door. Um, so my pleasure to be your first um, two after graduating. Um, I, yeah, I work for Encorco. I'm uh, both the chief operating officer and an executive coach um, with Encorco. And we we really focus and specialize on people that are at the really really the ends of their career. They could be um, mid-career too, but our sweet spot are those people that have had a really successful, highly intense career. And now they're looking at retirement. Um, but because they've been pretty highly successful and intense professionals, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to do anything. Um, <laughs> they usually go on and do different things, just using your their talents in different ways. So I think of it as personal strategic planning. Um, so, and we just, um, my co-founders, they have been working with, specifically with law firms for about 10 years and helping senior partners retire. And so I started working with them a year ago after I graduated from Pepperdine um, to help them scale and expand the business. So I've been working to put all of our business processes in place and I've recruited some wonderful executive coaches and we're really working on shifting the business model from business to business to business to consumer. So individuals rather than purely working with businesses. Interesting. And then I know that prior to joining, you worked um, as a consultant with your own uh, for yourself, I guess, for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, I'm wondering, are you still getting to do some of that one-on-one -on -one work yourself? Uh, again, as the COO, do you have time for both? Um, well, that's a, that's an interesting question. because I didn't over the last year. It was very, very busy. Um, but at this point, I'm starting to. Yeah, I'm starting to do some, um, I guess, exploring where I can do some one-on-one -on -one consulting or one-on-one -on -one coaching in mm -hmm. addition, because I've got the business processes set up, so I have a little bit more time available. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of transitioning, mm -hmm. you talk about how you manage that transition going from working for yourself for so long to working for an organization and having uh, partners mm -hmm. and other stakeholders, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. How was that for you after so many years? It was great. I, I was um, actually very intentional about wanting to work with other people more um, because while it's nice to have that freedom of working only for yourself, um, it's also uh, can be kind of lonely. You're the only one um, mm -hmm. and it, it can be kind of a challenge to make decisions and um, it's really nice um, to have a couple of co-founders that we can bounce ideas off of each other and brainstorm. And um, so I'm, I'm really, um, it was actually a very easy transition and something I was intentional about um, wanting. That's nice. I'm glad to hear that it, it worked out well. And are you, there's definitely benefits, I think, to working alongside others as much as I enjoy a long time and, and focus, et cetera, there's pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Are you hundred percent virtual or do you have opportunities to meet in person? And if so, how often? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, pretty much 100% virtual. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and my co-founders are in Tucson, um, Arizona. We do meet periodically, um, but it's not that often in person. We meet regularly every single week, a couple times a week uh, over Zoom. <laughs> but in person, we do, we intentionally do strategic planning at the beginning of the year. Um, and then I'd say every three, maybe once a quarter, we get together in person. Mm. And the, the work that you do for your clients, is that also virtual or in person or both? Uh, it's both. Um, the expansion that we're doing is more virtual than in person. So um, we're we are actually ha have we're piloting a workshop at the end of April that will be in person here in the Scottsdale area, which I think is going to be fun to have. A, I, I enjoy. I've done group workshops in my past work, um, but most of our work is done in a virtual one day program meeting. Uh, the coach meeting with the client. I see. I'm curious. Um, this is something you've been doing for a long time, leadership, coaching, development. Mm -hmm. What do you think drew you to that line of work? Um, well, it's interesting. I moved, I worked my way up in my prior corporate career before I changed careers into executive and leadership coaching. I was in, my first career was in supply chain and I worked for Medtronic, a medical implantable um, technology, very large organization. Um, and I started there as an individual contributor, but moved my way up to a um, director of supply chain. And um, I was always reading books about leadership and I realized that I enjoyed kind of the coaching aspect of my job and helping people in my organization to be successful. Um, I was always talking to people about what they needed to do to move up in the organization and how to um, have strong leadership skills. Um, and so, and, and always reading books on leadership. <laughs> it's just a curiosity, I guess, an intrigue of mine. And so um, that's, I think how it came about is I was just trying to improve it for myself. And then I was always trying to help the people that I was working with at the time. And so I actually hired a coach at that point in time um, on my own, out of my own wallet. I didn't have the organization pay for it just to help me think through and figure out what I wanted to do next. And I realized that I really enjoy um, helping people to develop their leadership skills. Mm. So it sounds like it's just part of your DNA and who you are and it's right. something you enjoy doing. Because um, it's definitely rewarding um, mm -hmm. that you're helping others. You mentioned you, you did a lot of reading of books. Just out of curiosity, is there any, you know, one or two books that sort of stand out to you of all the ones that you've read that you would say were really influential in your leadership journey? Um, yeah, well, one of my favorites, and I'm actually certified in her program, is by Brené Brown, uh, Dare to Lead. Um, I um, Initially, she had a book called Dare, The Daring Way, and I got it certified in that program back in 2013. And then that shifted into uh, the Dare to Lead book, which is really applying it, um, these daring way ideas and her research to leaders. And so that one, I, I love, I love that book. Mm -hmm. I'm always curious to learn about someone's leadership journey and where you are now versus where you were when you started, at least from a leadership perspective and how you see it. Yeah. So can you just share some, uh, some of some thoughts on how you define or, or see leadership now and contrast that to when you started your leadership journey and, and how mm -hmm. it may have changed? Yeah, well, yeah, it's changed a lot. And I think it, it you can't help but change when you learn, you learn more and get more experience. So both from knowledge, right? We, I feel like, oh my gosh, we learned a lot in our, management and leadership program at Pepperdine. Um, and even before that, I had learned a lot over the years. Um, and I realized I, I would probably approach my prior 
formal leadership roles from the past in larger organization, I would approach it very differently today than I did back then. And I think it's mm -hmm. just from virtue of the experiences and knowledge I've gained, right? We, we just yeah. learn all that, right? Um, and so I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, and you, you, I don't know if you hear this lately, but I've been hearing it more and more, and I, I love it, that people are, are talking about um, shifting as a leader from a, um, a knower to a learner. So I think when I, um, in the past, when I was in leadership roles, I felt like I had to know the answers. It was that, that's why I was in that leadership role is because I was supposed to have all the answers. And um, since then, I think I've really gained a lot more wisdom in knowing that there's a lot more that I don't know than I do know. Even with all the knowledge gained, I think the more I've learned, the more I realize I, how much I still have to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think shifting out of that knower and into being more of a learner um, and that level of curiosity and being open. I think I was open-minded before, but I just feel like there was this, I had this kind of belief that I was supposed to know more and I wasn't supposed to mm. not have the answers, right? You're supposed to have the answers if you're the leader. Mm. So, um, so that's a big one. And then the other one is just really empathizing and recognizing, um, really trying to get into the shoes of where the other person's coming from. I think in the past, I had a lot more, I would say, judgment of just not recognizing that someone just is coming from a very different place than where I'm coming from and not um, and judging them for that uh, versus stepping back and realizing that, hey, there could be some truth to what the, their perspective and staying open to that and really understanding their perspective better before mm -hmm. jumping into my, mm -hmm. uh, my own perspective. I see. Um, so empathy, agree with you 100% there. Um, and uh, I'm curious, uh, I know that in, in my professional experience and personally, there's there's been um, specific sort of um, events or, or things that have happened that have sort of helped shape me, mm -hmm. like evolve, uh, allowed me to evolve as a leader. Can you think of any anything that sort of stands out to you that was sort of instrumental or really like a pivotal moment where, you know, you made maybe a, a paradigm shift in the way you saw things? Yeah, one the one that I, th I think there's probably been, who knows, probably half a dozen of them. <laughs> but I would say one that the one that pops in my head is um, after I left the large organization I was in that I just mentioned and, and left my supply chain career. Um, and went out on my own, um, I realized that I was just naturally part, there, were, there was part of me, and it wasn't that obvious, but it became more obvious when I was on my own, that I was blaming, uh, you know, the organization or someone else in the organization for some of the challenges, right? I, I wasn't taking full responsibility. And then once I'm on my own, there's no, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> there's no one to blame, right? So that was a big, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't even realize I was doing it until I got out of um, and completely into a different uh, environment. Right. Um I think it's it's hard, right? It's it the, the easy thing to do is to look externally and maybe blame others, right? And and maybe that's why so few people are able to look internally because it, it's it's difficult. It hurts sometimes, and it's yeah. kind of like a wake up call, um, right? I think in the leadership journey, um, I'm curious. Um, as far as your so you when you transitioned again from working in logistics and supply chain you went and you worked on your own uh did you have a plan that you know these are the things that you needed to do in order to be successful and did you execute on it or you know what was you have any kind of approach or plan in place 
Yeah, yeah, oh uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm a major planner. Um, so I started planning almost a year before I took the leap and left. Um, it it, it kind of got pushed into that timeline though because we were laying off. I had to lay people off multiple years in a row, um, and it was very painful um, to both have to lay people really good people off and then also be worried that i was going to get laid off you just don't know right in that situation so um the second year in a row i had to lay people off i started planning so that the third year in a row when it came around the nice thing is that organization they let us um raise my i was able to raise my hand and volunteer so i still got a, a small severance package but i still got some severance as opposed to just quitting and walking out the door. So um, since I started planning a full year ahead, um, I was able to, you know, really save up. So part of it was planning for having enough uh, savings so that I could go without a regular paycheck, <laughs> knowing that it won't be a regular paycheck when you're on your own, right? Um, and then I had worked, I started working with a coach. So, and I worked with a coach that was an independent, business person who understood how to, um, you know, a lot of the things I needed to do. So I needed to get my website set up. I needed to start really networking. I part of several professional associations that I started networking with before I ever left my regular job. So there's a, you know, a whole list of things I started doing even before I walked out the door. Um, and so you know, it's funny, you, you talk about planning and the importance of planning when it comes to success. Yeah. Just earlier today, you know, also we talk about continuous learning and we don't know it all and um, there's right. so much to learn. I stumbled across something I had never heard before on a podcast. Rick Rubin, the music producer, was interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger on his podcast. Mm. He said, Schwarzenegger said something, the seven P's of success, proper prior planning present, prevents piss poor performance. Have you heard this before? And no. I, but again, it's just a weird coincidence that I heard this today and it was the first time I ever heard it and you talked about planning um, and the importance again of, of making things happen for yeah. yourself uh, through effort. What are some of the um, sort of credentials or certifications that one needs to obtain if they want to go the route you went as far as becoming again a professional leadership coach and consultant um well i'd really recommend because there's so many um there's so many coaches out there and you there's no common um licensing like there would be with a counselor um to set myself apart i I started um, getting certified in the International Coach Federation, ICF. And it's not easy. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. You have to take so many hours of training and then track your hours of coaching. And um, every three years, I have to get so much continuing education. And I actually, last year, after finishing, right, we're, I'm finishing up, finished the master's program in December 2022. So my three years of credentialing for the ICF was due by the end of 2023. And I thought, oh my gosh, I just can't go get more, you know, continuing education units. And then I talked to a good friend of mine, I was sharing how the challenge, and she said, oh my gosh, Paula, you've learned so much through your master's program, just write it up and, and justify and show how it could be continued. And I did, so I did that. And voila it worked <laughs> i was so glad because i was about ready to just say forget it because you have to keep up with these continuing education so it's not it's not easy but i'd say it's worth it um to do the icf and then the other thing that i'm not as involved anymore but i was at the time when i started my business i was involved in the national speakers association hmm. and there was a lot of good networking and a lot of skill building not even necessarily around speaking but around having your own business and consulting that i learned a lot from that professional association so that's another one that i would recommend if you're looking at going on your own for consulting because speaking is just a good way to market if you're if you're willing to do it i see so you would you had been working for so many years again but yet you decided to go and get your masters it doesn't yeah. sound like you needed it but maybe 
you want to do. Can you talk a little bit more about what drove you to do that? Yeah, well, yeah, and that's exactly right. I didn't actually, I don't feel like I needed it necessarily, um, but I did, you know, it's one of those things, Antoine, that I would look back periodically about and say, you know, I wish I would have gotten my master's, but I was just never, I was never uh, attracted to the traditional MBA program. I don't know why, I just wasn't. And so when I found this Master of Science in Management and Leadership, I thought, oh my gosh, this is around what I'm really passionate about. Maybe this is a better fit. Um, and so I started looking into it and I really liked the program. And so I thought, you know what? And I always had... It's so interesting. I'd always had this little bit of, I think, insecurity around the fact that my undergrad was in supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. More logistics, materials management. It really wasn't in leadership. And yet that's the career I've shifted into. So I wanted to, I think, get some of that academic knowledge um, so that I felt a little more confident. And, and it really helped. It really helped, I think, with just my confidence um by getting that degree mm -hmm. and what made you choose pepperdine uh did you know straight away that's where you wanted to be or was there a, a process of uh, where you sort of decided where you wanted to go yeah i looked um i looked at several programs um i had a pri i have a colleague who she was years ago we worked together um and at the time when we were working together she got her um, Master of Science in Org Development, so her MSOD at Pepperdine. So I was familiar with Pepperdine from her going through it. And so I had a conversation with her and um, she also shared another connection of ours that had gone to Pepperdine. And then I talked, so I talked to actually a couple more people that were alumni of Pepperdine and they all had such glowing things to say about the program, um, about the school, not necessarily the program. Um, and But I again, I looked at the OD program too, and I was like, mm, it didn't quite fit what I wanted. So, but yeah, Pepperdine came from multiple conversations. Mm. And and could you summarize, is there one thing that stands out at you, uh, stands out for you the most as far as your, your biggest takeaway that you benefited from that experience? Oh, it's hard to pick one. Um, I don't know. I think probably the biggest thing is, like I mentioned earlier, that level of confidence. And because mm -hmm. part of what came up in that program is, I know, and it came up in the course you and I were in, and it came up in multiple courses that I was in, that I've got a, a experience that I can tap into that I just didn't quite recognize and realize that mm -hmm. my the the value of my leadership experience so i think just having gone through the program and look, seeing all of the the knowledge and the experience i gained um i guess in a new way um yeah. is probably the biggest thing but i i do pull things out i mean i just pulled out um information from our um the talent development course the mm -hmm. other day because just really enjoyed that course. <laughs> Me too. Um, would you say then that having those years of experience gave you real practical uh, knowledge to draw from when going through the coursework? And maybe if you hadn't had that experience, maybe it wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't say easy, but maybe it wouldn't have resonated as much because it's theory until you live it, right? So you live it. Yeah, it probably, yeah, it probably wouldn't have resonated as much. You're right. I think, I think that's, um, I think there's more value in having had some lived experience when you're learning that theory. I agree. So shifting back to the work that you've done with leadership coaching, um, I'm assuming over the course of the years, you've helped many, many different people. And I'm just curious, have you identified any like common themes that you see repeat over and over again? Or, you know, is it really just all over the board as far as where people are at when they come to you and the types of things that they need help sort of, you know, 
overcoming or, or understanding yeah. in order to grow. Is, is there any common themes that say that? Um, well, there's, there is a good variety. I think one of the big ones that I see um, that I know was a, a learning for me initially too, um, and I, I see it with a lot of leaders, is to really recognize that um, we judge ourselves by our internal intentions and we judge others by their behaviors. Mm. So I, I, one of my, um, one of the, he, he was a great leader, one of the leaders I worked with, I just really enjoyed working with him, but he just said to me one day, he said, oh my gosh, I just realized my team can't see the map in my head. Right? It just, they, they can't. And so I think that is a big one, especially, um, well, at even newer and experienced leaders. It's just, you forget that people have no idea what's going on inside that head of yours. <laughs> and so um, I think that's a common thing that just helping them understand that their behaviors are what the team is um, mm -hmm. judging them on. Mm. Did you ever, did everyone you worked with, was it their choice? Did they come to you voluntarily or were there any cases where maybe uh, they were assigned sort of to work with you uh, and they were hesitant or sort of resisting your help? And if so, how did you overcome that? Yeah. Uh, good question. Ideally, my first choice are people that volunteer, you know, that they really do want, because in order to um, be open and, and change and get better, you have to have a level of motivation. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked with a few um, over the years um, that were not necessarily excited about it, um, but <laughs> Um, I think part of it is um, if if they can get to a point where they start opening up and sharing um, and being a little bit vulnerable, I guess, um, is a way to think of it, um, then that can make that shift into where they're appreciating and recognizing the value mm. in the coaching. So in order uh, to be vulnerable, they have you have to create trust. And oh, yeah. can you give me any, uh, can you share any thoughts around how, do, what techniques or tactics do you use when you meet someone, you're trying to build some trust so you can get them to open up and, and mm -hmm. be vulnerable? Um, well, th one of the biggest things is just modeling it myself. So sharing a little bit about my own um, challenges that I've had in the past. Um, it's, and, you know, framing it that it's different for everyone, right? But I'll share with, you know, I'll share with them some of my, oh my gosh, if I knew now what I'd known then, I would have led completely differently in the past. <laughs> so um, just, I think some of that's sharing to, to, so that they know that I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just demonstrating through my through our conversations that I do care about them and I have no no I have no agenda. There's nothing. I mean, that's part of the beauty of having an independent coach. There's my only agenda is to really listen and mm -hmm. bring out the best in them. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. There's no other agenda. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, uh, are you meeting with uh, individuals? you know, one time or many times over the course of weeks or months or even years? Um, oh yeah, it's, it takes time. Um, it's rare that we go years, but I have had a few clients that have gone years. Um, typically when I'm first meeting with somebody new to this whole process, I'll explain that it just, it takes time to dig in and get to a point where you're making some behavioral changes that are helpful to you. Mm -hmm. um, so usually I'd say on average, it takes about six months. Um, mm -hmm. It can be quicker. Like I, part of what I love about what we do at Encorico is um, 
my uh, co-founder, Elizabeth, she's come up with this really brilliant program that takes you through a, a series of exercises that you can work through in a day, through a Zoom program over a day. And we take breaks and write, right, but it's really a pretty intense day. And you get through a lot um, and it opens up a lot. And then we have follow-up coaching. So some of it, you can let it, you know, settle in and percolate and then we talk about it in our next coaching call um but that process i think expedites it um mm -hmm. because you're not meeting for say 45 minutes every other week which would go out for a while you're doing it pretty intensely for a day and then you're having a, f a few follow-up coaching sessions um so it makes it much quicker do you ever keep in touch with any of your um clients and you know, from years ago, who still sort of um, uh, connect with you and maybe let you know how things are going? Absolutely. Yeah, I, a few of them I do. And in fact, I was just thinking about a few of them the other day of calling them and finding out what they're up to. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of them, uh, she and I have almost, I'd say we really shifted out of the coach um, client into more friendship. Um, we, she was one of my first longer term clients many years ago so that's wonderful um so final question um any advice you have for new first-time leaders that are beginning their journey uh, that they could use to uh, help set them on the right course um let's see advice uh well i think it goes back to that that theme that I was sharing with you about recognizing that you judge yourself by your intentions and others by their behaviors is just recognizing that um, and that um, it's a journey, right? You're never quite done and give yourself some grace um, <laughs> as you're learning. Mm -hmm. And if you can, I, I'd say get a coach <laughs> just because um, if you're, if, if you're, organization would pay for it oh my gosh go for it right um because it's just nice to have somebody to bounce things off of um somebody you can feel that's completely outside the organization so. that's a perfect way to end our conversation so how would somebody get a hold of you uh, either personally or through your organization online or um yeah you can well encoreco.com is e n c o r c o Cora and Cora, <laughs> I'm not even spelling right. E N C O R O A C O dot com mm -hmm. and Coraco dot com um, is our website. Um, or Paula Shoup, if you just if you Google me, my my own personal leadership coach website will come up too. I'll make sure to put links to both in the um, uh, links in the conversation below. Uh, right. So, Paula, thank you again for taking the time out. I know you're super busy, so I'm really grateful and appreciative for you carving out some time for me. It's been a pleasure, and um, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch and seeing how your journey continues. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Antoine. It's nice to stay in touch with you. Likewise.